Thank you. Um, I'm Jim Mulshine. I'm here with the Prevent Cancer Foundation, where I've had the pleasure and privilege of serving uh, as a board member for a number of years with uh, Carolyn Aldiger, who's the founder and CEO, and my other colleague on the board, Joanne Piccolo. And we're delighted to be back because um, for those, anybody here in the audience uh, present for this presentation in Bethesda last year? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we got one. Okay. So we, we were trying to give a report about what your efforts of you and your colleagues here and online um, in the internet uh, have done through supporting the activities of the Prevent Cancer Foundation. The Pre Prevent Cancer Foundation is a foundation across America but headquartered in Alexandria, Virginia that attempts to focus on the early detection and the improvement of outcomes for cancer through prevention and early detection. Now this is really important because all those other cancer foundations are doing wonderful work, but that's really for people who have cancer. And Prevent Cancer tries to get in a little bit earlier and tries to intercept the trajectory of, of, of really unfortunate lethal outcomes for cancer. So we have been uh, involved in a dialogue with the Awesome Games community for the last several years because your colleagues approached the Prevent Cancer Foundation and said, you know, we kind of like what you're doing. We've visited a lot of websites and your website kind of captured some things that we are very, think very important. And one of them is prevention. And the other thing is that the Prevent Cancer Foundation, either directly or through collaboration, attempts to improve outcomes across the United States. And through part of the dialogue with the Awesome Games community, there was a, a wish also to extend that kind of sensitivity to focusing on the early stages of cancer and doing something meaningful about that while people are still healthy, and to extend that internationally. And so through that dialogue, this is what has emerged. The Prevent Cancer Foundation has been able to use funds from this forum to seed research activities that are felt to be important in other national settings. And we're going to be talking about several of those projects. And it's very important because the United States is a very heterogeneous community. In the United States, international problems that are very, very important in the third world are also important in Detroit and Chicago and New York and, and Orlando. And so we kind of share these problems and we're trying to bring thoughtful, very, very reasonable, very, very effective and, and um, sustainable solutions to populations that need it most. So it's been a, an honor for this foundation to be able to work with your membership to extend the vision of prevention to international settings. Now, I got to admit it, I'm, I'm not particularly, um, I've never been accused of being a gamer. <laughs> Lots of other things, but not that one. And I love games, but if I did games, I, I, I wouldn't do anything else. So I, I've kind of avoided them, but it was really eye-opening to come to Bethesda last year because it was such a great and <laughs> exuberant interaction that, that I was not, frankly, previously aware of. And so one of the key things about it that I thought was so nice was that everybody got along. There was a respectful relationship across the entire event. And it was kind of interesting because, you know, somebody likes this game, someone likes that game, someone's old school games, but everybody's curious about, you know, what's going on here and oh, that's great and oh, that's really cool, we should try to do that or whatever. And so I, I point that out because that culture of, of curiosity and that culture of acceptance is something that the Prevent Cancer Foundation tries to bring. Because prevention is not something that you can just do for the people that can afford it. Prevention is what we as a society try to do for everybody. And so it, it, it's very, very important. And everybody is not confined to a national border. It's everybody. And so we're gonna be talking about those kinds of efforts. 
And we're going to be talking about strategies in which even in resource constrained environments, we can help people to have much healthier lives. So we're going to be hearing about that. Um, there's a number of examples that are not going to be talked about today that are possible because of Prevent Cancer Foundation funding. Now, the Prevent Cancer Foundation happens to have a website in which they spent a lot of time putting together all those activities so that if anybody's curiosity is spurred by this interaction today, if you go to the Prevent Cancer Foundation website, they have a, uh, right on their homepage, they have an awesome games done quick section and you can go there and get much greater detail about these programs and other programs that have been supported through this mechanism. And we do not have a lot of pharmaceutical products coming out of the prevention space. We don't have a lot of, of, of a billion dollar companies working in the prevention space. So the resources that you make available for these projects is incredibly important because I think you'll hear from some of the other speakers that if it weren't for this funding, this kind of work would not happen. So we're talking about incredible impact from the, from the resources that are making available. Um, you're going to hear about some evolving things in the prevention space, and uh, at least one and maybe more of the, of the um, presentations are going to touch on the issue of artificial intelligence. And I'm bringing this up because last, last time we talked about, and Rick talked about some of his work with um, uh, um, image analysis of medical images. And I think in the gaming space, you people are, <laughs> are seeing a lot of artificial intelligence creeping in in various places. And, and um, it's a very powerful tool. But artificial intelligence in the United States, the way the United States does business right now, is going to come forward as a lot of entrepreneurial activities. We think that's great. It's going to happen, but we'd also like to make sure that the benefits of artificial intelligence are also available to the people on this planet who need it the most. And the people who get the most cancers and the worst cancers are the people who have the least amount of resources. And the power of artificial intelligence in terms of supporting the decision-making process for caregivers is something that everybody should have access to. And so we're going to be talking about some, some potential, potential strategies that will impact that and about democratizing that technology so it will be available to enhance the health of the global community. So I think that's enough from me. And what I'd like to do is um, we have three presenters today who have very, very important and interesting projects to talk about. Again. I want them to have as much time as possible to talk about their projects, so I'll just introduce them very briefly. We're going to go, be going across the table, and so we'll be starting with Peter Kingham from Memorial Sloan Kettering, who's a surgeon who has an incredible commitment to global health that you'll hear about, and he's a very capable um, hepatobiliary specialist in his, in his day life in New York on York Avenue but he has been involved in a number of activities that he'll touch upon. And then to his right is uh, Professor Nimi uh, Ramunajan. Ramanujan. Ramanujan, I apologize, who is a professor of biomedical engineering at Duke and has been involved also in a number of innovative uh, activities associated with 20 issued U.S. patents uh, on, on technology that you're going to hear about that potentially also has incredible relevance in, in uh, resource-limited uh, international settings, including back in the United States. And then finally, to, uh, to Denimi's right, is Rick Avila. Rick Avila is a computer scientist who's had a long interest in medical imaging uh, and, and image analysis development. He led the CAD development for GE um, Medical uh, Sciences for a number of years. And he's been working with a company that he's developed that is working on the quantitative imaging space in terms of developing tools to, um, to, to leverage that in a way that will be much more robust for that type of, of decision support analysis. 
So w without further ado, I'd like to uh, turn the mic over to Peter. And uh, could you talk about your exciting activity in Africa? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, this is my first time at, uh, at this conference. And uh, I had about a half hour to sit around and, and watch in some of the side rooms. And a uh, huge learning experience for me. Uh, but I'm really happy to be here because I think it's really important for you all to understand uh, where some of the money that's raised here goes to. So I want to introduce uh, myself and my team from Sloan Kettering in New York and Nigeria uh, and explain a bit about what we're doing and why your support is so important. Because unfortunately, we cannot rely on uh, the U.S. government, for instance, to, to fund all of our research. They fund one in 15 or one in 20 applications. So we really rely on, uh, on us, the community in the United States, to, to support research like this. So um, I'm going to talk a bit about what we're doing in Nigeria. So who are we? Well, I, I'm a cancer surgeon. I operate on patients with liver and pancreas cancer, uh, cancers. And in this slide uh, uh, is, a, is a, an example of how I spend a lot of my time when I'm in the US, which is doing robotic surgery and focus a lot on the application of technology in the operating room. Because for liver and pancreas cancer surgeries, they're very complex. And we try and take advantage of anything we can from technology to improve our outcomes. Isaac is on this slide as well. Isaac is my colleague from Nigeria, Isaac Alatiche. He's a, a surgeon. We met about uh, 11, 12 years ago. And we've been collaborating because we realized that uh, cancer was a very large growing problem in sub-Saharan Africa. And we tried to uh, figure out, you know, how can we use technology like I'm using in New York that is somehow applicable in Nigeria to help out patients? Because it may be different. Um, so that, that was a question that we, we asked early on. And part of the reason why this has become important is because cancers like we know of in the US and are so common, like breast cancer and colon cancer, these rates are really rising rapidly in low resource environments. So sub-Saharan Africa, the rates of breast and colorectal cancer uh, are starting to rise. A lot of the reason why is because as development happens, things that we think of as standard in the US, like fast food, uh, all, all come in. So this was an article from the New York Times about obesity rising in Ghana uh, and associating it with all the new KFC chains. And unfortunately, this is what we also export, is uh, things that add to, into the environment of, uh, of, uh, of, of patients uh, forming cancers. So because of this, we sort of created a model about how we can think of a cancer patient in Nigeria. This is in purpose drawn in a circle because all of these uh, interplay with each other. If you start at the top, that, what's the epidemiology? So who, who gets a cancer? Next, biology. How, how does it actually act biologically? What is the DNA? What's the mutations uh, that triggers these cancers? Next is screening and diagnosis. You know, how do you find these cancers at an early stage? Uh, then outcomes and treatment. Once you identify a patient with cancer, how do you treat them? Is it surgery? Is it chemotherapy? Uh, and then, importantly, how do you even get access to care in a low-resource environment? And all of these intersect with each other. And we've spent a lot of our time really focusing on screening and diagnosis because, unfortunately, unlike in the U.S. where we have cancer screening, uh, in most low-resource environments, screening doesn't really exist. So patients, instead of presenting with very early-stage cancers that can be cured, present with much later stage cancers where really all you can do is make someone more comfortable and you really don't have an opportunity to, to treat the cancer. So if I could ex explain to you uh, in visually the difference between how a woman presents with breast cancer in the U.S. versus Nigeria, I think it, it's these, uh, uh, these two foods. In the U.S., most women with breast cancer are identified at very small size tumors. Because in the US, you can get ultrasounds, you can get mammograms, uh, and there's a lot of knowledge in the community about if you have a lump, you should have it checked out. Whereas in Nigeria, the average tumor size is 10 centimeters, basically the size of a grapefruit. So by the time a tumor, uh, by the time a woman with a tumor presents, uh, the cancer is often late stage, late stage and has already spread, uh, and there's really no opportunity for curing that woman. So what this is really screaming for is a way to diagnose earlier. So one of the projects that we've had funded uh, through Prevent Cancer Foundation with money that you all have donated is to trial this device. This is a handheld device. It's called the iBreast. Um, and the way this works is, and I'll, you can come up and look afterwards if you'd like, is there's 16 little squares on the head of this. These are uh, little ceramic tiles. And you can place this on the breast and it measures tissue stiffness. It doesn't tell you if someone has a cancer. All it tells you is in the tissue beneath this device, there is something stiffer than the rest of the area. And 
once it's positioned on the breast, then there's a readout, and what these green boxes are is each green box is, a, is, is one of the breasts, so a right breast and a left breast, and you can see uh, in uh, one of them there's a red, red area, and that red area is lighting up, saying that there is something stiffer underneath the area where you are. This maps out to, uh, it connects with uh, Bluetooth to a, a, a tablet, and then can be uploaded and stored, and then that image can be used to then guide a radiologist using an ultrasound or a mammogram to look at the breast and, and say, what is this red area? Is it something that's suspicious? Do we need to biopsy this? Uh, or is it just, there's a cyst there. It's completely benign. Now we know this and the, and the woman knows that there's no risk. So the way that we started with this is the device actually was developed in uh, the US, in New York. The first trials were done on women at University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Lakan Olasahinde, who's pictured here, is one of the really uh, fantastic junior faculty members on our team in Nigeria. And Lakan uh, has really made this the centerpiece of his career, trying to figure out how to screen for breast cancer in Nigeria. So he started by going to Kenya. So Kenya's on the east coast of, of Africa. That's him in, uh, in Nairobi, where he went and learned how to use the device when the company was visiting there and training. Then he went back to Nigeria. This is him training the um, uh, breast screening team that we developed as part of this project. And it actually does come back home as well. This is a picture of the Harlem Breast Center, which uh, is affiliated with, with my hospital, Sloan Kettering in New York, because there's a lot of disparities and uh, barriers to care in Nigeria that also exist 30 blocks north of where my office is in Manhattan. And we're trying to figure out how can we learn from one place to help another because none of these problems are isolated. So the other part of doing research is, uh, especially in a low resource environment, we don't have the luxury of just doing research. We really need to factor in capacity building and education all at the same time and do it all together. So in this project specifically, that's Lacan uh, and Fumi, who are two of the uh, surgeons sitting at a microphone. That's because they're doing radio jingles. Most uh, people get their news in Nigeria through cell phones, uh, blasts, WhatsApp, uh, and through the radio, not through television. So we do a lot of patient education stuff and awareness through radio jingles. And uh, the three women pictured here are three of the four nurses who make up the breast screening team. They've become uh, true experts on breast screening and issues with breast screening in Nigeria as an offshoot of this project. So that's them uh, at one of the sites where uh, we were doing the project. This is Lacan uh, in uh, Lagos about two months ago, where um, that was the third city that we've been to, to to do this project. And it involves a whole program on just breast health education. Uh, for all the women who come to be a part of this program. Uh, then they use the device. The device takes, the, the, uh, it takes about two or three minutes to actually screen a breast. So the woman goes through an educational uh, process, then has the breast screening. If we find something, if so if that red dot lights up and there is found to be an area of the breast that is stiffer than the uh, other parts, all these women do get ultrasounds and mammograms so we can uh, determine what is the actual utility of this device. So, so what are we learning for this? This study is a 400-woman study. We just completed it about a month ago. We're analyzing the data currently. We'll have the data analysis in a couple of months where we'll be able to, to determine, is there actually a role for this? So I sit here as, uh, as someone who's, who's researching this, not as an advocate of the device. My advocacy is we need devices to help improve the outcomes for women with cancer. I'm hoping this device or something like it works. We have to do good trials like this to really figure it out. Um, so every woman gets a clinical breast examination, which is what traditionally is done, and then we add in this eye breast device, and then every woman gets the ultrasound and the mammogram, and we'll be able to say after 400 women, is this device worthy of study in a much larger trial, or is it not? Because unfortunately, there's been about 15 devices like this so far, and none of them have been worthy of study. Um, and, but this one, we think, uh, was, was worthy of at least uh, this, this big of a look. We're also about to start our Harlem breast study um, using the results from the women in Nigeria to help guide how we're looking at this in, uh, in Harlem, New York. We also have a second grant from the Prevent Cancer Foundation and from the, the money that was, is raised through your event. And this one is about to start. And this is a similar question, but it has to do with colorectal cancer. So if I had to show a, a photo with fruits or with, with foods, it would be the same thing. In the US, you can get a colonoscopy. You get a colonoscopy, they find a little polyp, remove the polyp, that's actually prevented you from getting a cancer. Or if you have an early stage cancer, that, that's, that's when it's diagnosed. In Nigeria, there is no screening for colon cancer. So instead, most patients present 
like this young gentleman. This is a 26-year-old uh, who presented with, you can see his, his, his abdomen is a bit distended. The reason why is because he has a, uh, a tumor in his rectum that's blocking the outflow of his colon. So his colon is blown up with air. And he needs an emergency surgery to bring his colon out to his skin uh, to decompress it. This is very rare for us in the U.S. to have patients who are 26 show up with a tumor like this. And I operated on this patient with Isaac at about 2 a.m. Uh, uh, many years ago. And that led us down this path of saying this is, this is so rare in the U.S., but actually so common in Nigeria. Younger patients with these large tumors um, presenting very late. So how, how can we affect, uh, uh, how can we change this? So there's a fairly simple test to help diagnose earlier stage colorectal cancer. It's just looking at, for blood in stool. And this test uses an antibody to, to, uh, to blood. Um, so if there's microscopic blood, which there shouldn't be in your stool, it's picked up on the test. The way it works is there's, um, uh, you unscrew the top, uh, you dip it in stool, and then you, and you put it back in this uh, little test tube, which sounds very simple until you try and do this in a place like Nigeria where the average toilet is a pit latrine, which is, com you know, it, it, it's uh, used by many people. It's, it's not in the, in the comfort of your own home. People have a problem dealing with stool in the U.S. It's much harder to deal with stool when you're dealing with uh, 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 in a place that has uh, facilities like this. So we're trying to answer the question, how, how can you do stool testing in a country like Nigeria? Because all the world bodies say this is what should be done, but yet no one's actually studied it. And no one's looked at the actual barriers. So there's things like this. We've already found out from pilot testing, 20% of the tests in Nigeria are inaccurate. Very, uh, most of the patients there walk around in a very dehydrated state compared to us. They have much fewer bowel movements. Uh, the stool's very thick. When they put it in, uh, it actually clogged up the test. Nobody had really uh, thought about that. The other thing is temperature uh, alters positivity. Huge problem in a sub-Saharan African country. What this graph shows is if you do the test and it's positive, so this is 10 positive tests on day two, if you leave that test sitting out by day eight, three of those tests have turned from positive to negative. So they would be false negatives. So how you handle the, the, how you handle the specimens in a place like Nigeria also may need to be a little bit different than what the rest of the world is used to. So this is the team uh, that we've gathered together. There's Isaac standing in the middle with a team of nurses who uh, are doing the tests, and then all the patients get stool testing um, for blood, but then they also get a colonoscopy, so we can help prove that the test does or does not work in Nigeria. And then Greg uh, Knapp, who's one of our fellows, is, uh, has been there for six months and has helped uh, spearheading this. So next year, uh, this, uh, this project will be completed, and hopefully we'll have an answer about uh, how we can find earlier stage colorectal cancer in Nigeria. This is a picture of uh, our whole team combining Sloan Kettering and a lot of our Nigerian faculty at our annual symposium last April. Um, so I sit here uh, coming down from New York, but uh, all of what I'm showing you here is, uh, is really what I'm representing from New York, but also from Nigeria and all our colleagues there who can't be here to thank you themselves, but, but they're happy to know that I'm here in Orlando uh, uh, talking about them um, to, to all of you guys. So thank you very much. Nimi? Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Nimi Ramanujam, and I'm a professor at Duke. And um, right now, I'm really passionate about um, women's health and women's health disparities and um, how we can think about inverted models of care that create more access and more autonomy for women uh, that have challenging issues, particularly issues with um, cancer prevention. So, um, you know, Peter talked about breast cancer. One of the cancers that we're very concerned about and thinking about a lot is cervical cancer. And so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that today. So I don't have stock in Target, but I really subscribe to this pay less, expect more idea. And so I want to sort of bring you to the way we um, screen, diagnose, and treat cancer in this country which is actually quite similar in, on principle in other places as well. Your first sort of entry is into the primary care facility where there's some sort of screening, hopefully, that allows you to then know whether you need to take the next step. That requires you to go back to a facility where someone is going to do a diagnostic test to determine if you actually have something that needs to be treated. And if it's positive, Yet again, you have to go back to a health facility to get the appropriate treatment. We are very used to this model and you know, we drive our cars or you know, 
take the subway to um, the health facilities, but in rural North Carolina or in places like rural Peru, um, one has to maybe take multiple bus rides and uh, there's a huge opportunity cost to getting to these places to get the care they need. So how can we think about consolidating these multiple visits. And also there's this idea of, you know, going to your primary care provider where you're familiar with the person. Imagine having to meet more and more strangers during the care cascade to get more and more sort of evaluations and treatment. How can we consolidate and bring that to the front line so that the majority of the population can access it? We're doing our work all over the world and we're also now exploring how we can do this um, in North Carolina and dealing with the regulatory and policy issues to do just that. So what happens most often when people don't have access to care or they're under or uninsured um, or have some barrier to care, the, the consequences they present with advanced cancer, just like Peter mentioned, and the cost of therapy is just exorbitantly high. Right? And it continues to get more and more expensive. And the reality is that the bigger return on investment is to prevent cancer altogether or nip it in the bud so that it never gets to a stage where it's untreatable. And so really, that's the aspiration uh, for us. So this doesn't apply to all cancers, but there is a major public health milestone we have made with one cancer, cervical cancer. And we have achieved a major health public milestone because first of all, we've identified a way to treat the early stages of the disease before it ever becomes cancer. And this has actually dramatically dropped the incidence of cervical cancer in this country and other high income countries. The second is it's probably the only disease, and Peter can correct me if I'm wrong, where we actually have a preventative vaccine. Now, there's a debate about you know, the uptake of the vaccine, but the reality is there is a vaccine. It's hard to say that about many other cancers. So this is an exemplar for how you can actually prevent cancer and using this as both a test bed to understand how we can invert care models and at the same time prevent unjustifiable deaths, which are disproportionately prevalent in low resource settings, we can actually um, kill two birds with the same stone. So I show this, this pie chart, or this, 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 um, this graph with, with the proportion of expenditures for cancer in the United States. And the blue part corresponds to um, hospital um, health facility vis visits. And our goal is to think about whether we can develop tools that can allow um, less experienced providers in community health settings to provide care that's on par with what you would get in a hospital. So eliminating the need for multiple touch points and multiple visits. And the second is, could we even advance it further to think about home health, particularly in the case of cervical cancer screening where privacy and embarrassment, these are issues that come up all the time. How can you actually give women who are at risk the power to do their own tests in the comfort of their home? So what I'd like to talk about next is um, some of the technologies we have developed to do this. And basically what I'm describing is an Uber model for healthcare. So could nurses and midwives and even women themselves do the primary screening instead of primary care providers. And you know, we talked about, and Jim talked about AI algorithms, which could essentially create a virtual expert who can make a decision. And then can we bring therapies to the point of care that can actually provide treatment that could ensure that these women don't go on to get cancer. So it's not enough to just screen and diagnose, but we really need the therapies that um, will prevent that disease from occurring. So we're thinking about the entire continuum and not just one part of it, because we recognize that if you screen and you find more women with disease, you have to do something about it. You can't just ignore it. So I'm gonna talk about two examples today and then end with a third for which I don't have um, a little gadget to show you. So the first example is when a woman comes in after a pap smear, 
uh, let's say she has a positive pap smear. She comes into a clinic to get an exam called colposcopy. And in a colposcopic exam, the provider has this uh, low power microscope that's about as tall as I am, maybe a little shorter, definitely heavier, and um, quite expensive. And the idea is to be able to magnify, get a magnified view of the cervix, identify areas that are uh, diseased, take a biopsy, and then recommend the patient for treatment if she has something that needs to be treated. Now, this device is not only extremely large, unwieldy, and expensive, but the maintenance of this device requires that it requires a hospital setting, um, it requires an expert to use it, and um, it is um, not accessible in places where people actually live and are seeking care. So I was in Moshi, Tanzania about six years ago, and when I was in the reproductive uh, clinic there at um, the KCMC hospital, um, one of the providers there said, you know, you can read all the papers you want, but the reality is women are afraid. Women are really afraid of coming for cervical cancer screening because it invades their privacy, it's embarrassing, and frankly, it's painful because you have to use this metal object called the speculum to essentially see their cervix to then make a diagnosis. So he said, why can't you build something that actually could just go take a close-up of the cervix so that we could get rid of all these um, devices that cause pain and require an expert? And so that inspired us to think about developing a colposcope that looks like a tampon. So the basic idea was, instead of having the device outside, could you bring it inside and through the speculum? And when you do that, you can basically um, wash out the costs to, by using simple LEDs and a CMOS camera, and guess what, you can get images that are on par, if not better, than a $15,000 colposcope, all because you just rethought the way gynecology is performed. So this is basically thinking about getting rid of the speculum or using the device through a speculum. And the Prevent Cancer Foundation is um, supporting us to use the speculum-free version of this device in Peru where community health providers will go door to door and actually give these coloscopes, which allow women to use this device themselves so that they can get an image which can be processed in a remote facility and so all of the care gets to their home. So that's a second generation device, but this would be, for example, used in a community clinic by health providers. So, I mentioned this idea of if you see, you need to think about treating. And a common way to treat um, cervical precancers is through ablation, and in particular using uh, cryotherapy. But you need a CO2 cylinder, and while you can get that for Coca-Cola, not so easy to get that for cervical precancer treatment. So this time I was in Lusaka, Zambia, and I was in a clinic there, and I remember seeing a whole lot of nothing actually, because there was no power and nothing really was working, but there was ethanol. Yeah, 100% alcohol on the table, on the countertop, and they use that to disinfect. I mean, they just use that, they call it spirit, and they use it for, you know, basically disinfecting the table and other things. And so I was really excited, and I don't know if we can get this movie to work, um, but I can tell you about it. So what we did is we came back super excited thinking, oh, we could use ethanol to ablate these lesions. How inexpensive would that be? And in fact, it's been used for uh, treatment of inoperable liver cancers in this country and other countries, and we thought, nothing is that simple. Turns out that ethanol, while it is very destructive, when you inject it into the body, it goes everywhere. It's very hard to contain it where you need it to be. So what happens is when you're trying to treat inoperable cancer, you end up using a lot, and most of it goes away, and very little gets to the region of interest. So one of my grad students one day was trying to figure out how to make ethanol thicker, and he came across this polymer called ethyl cellulose. It's used in pharmaceuticals, it's used in cosmetics, and it turns out that when he, was, when he added it, it definitely became more viscous, but here's the secret. When he added water, it turned from liquid to a gel. So what does that mean for us? It means that you can take ethanol mixed with this polymer and you can inject it. 
at a certain flow rate, a certain volume, and lo and behold, when it gets into the tissue that it needs to, it basically creates a gel and a slow release sort of design that treats only the region of interest, which you can control by the delivery. And um, what I would have shown you if these videos worked is that when you inject ethanol alone into a tumor in the hamster cheek pouch here, the ethanol just goes everywhere. But when you inject it with this polymer, it goes in like a liquid, but then it becomes a gel and nothing leaks, which means that all of the potency is in the tumor. So this is what we get, and it's pretty remarkable. So we treated spontaneous squamous cell cancers with this very simple uh, you know, formulation. And we use just a 27 gauge needle, just like, you know, that's, that's routinely available. And you can see on the top the formulation that we created in the bottom, just plain old ethanol that's already used in the clinic. And what you see is that uh, right after the tumor is ablated, the bottom image shows leakage of the ethanol everywhere. Um, there's food coloring in the ethanol here. And on the top, you can see it's completely retained in the tumor. A day after ablation, you can see the tumor has necrosed on the top. And on day seven, the tumor is completely gone. And we were really excited. Of course, we did a statistically significant sample size, and we saw this happening again and again. And also what's exciting about this particular formulation is cervical precancer is caused by um, the HPV virus, so there's a virus involved. So when you ablate a tumor or a precancer, you're also creating an immune response. So that actually is another benefit of using this ablation method, even for, say, combination therapy with a chemotherapeutic drug or an immunotherapy drug. In fact, that's being done with radiation, but we think ethanol ablation can do the same. But what's nice about it is because it can carry, uh, because the polymer sequesters the ethanol, you can put other drugs in there relatively um, easily. So we have developed these tools, and we haven't developed them in a vacuum. We've actually now, um, we have partnerships in eight countries. The pocket colposcope has been disseminated in all of these countries, and we're working specifically in Peru and Kenya to disseminate the coloscope that I mentioned, which allows women to do self-testing. There is a self-test for the HPV virus, so if you could do self-test for the HPV virus, which is sort of a, an alternative to the pap smear, and you can have a home-based screening um, that allows um, imaging to happen, which can then be processed with AI. What that means is that 98 out of every 100 women will never have to leave home to go to any kind of bricks and mortar health facility. And the way we're doing this is we essentially recruit um, housewives in these rural communities that actually are not doing anything, uh, uh, any kind of professional work. And so what they do is they get paid a portion. They're basically female entrepreneurs who essentially go door to door and deliver these devices. And then women actually use them. And then they're sent to a central repository processed and the woman gets an SMS so that she can then go to a clinic if she needs to. But then again, two out of every 100 women would ever need to do that. So the idea is to democratize care the idea is to invert the pyramid, and the idea is to give women more autonomy over their care so they can do that on their own terms. And so um, we're very excited to start the study in Peru to see um, how we can get the first part of the care continuum um, into women's hands and be able to really um, empower them to um, uh, prevent cancer in their communities for themselves and others in the communities. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and we'll now move on to Rick Avila. Oh, sorry. The slides? Let's move this over a little bit. Oh, sure. So uh, Jim introduced me before. I'm a computer scientist. Uh, I've spent all my life uh, all my career, I should say, um, basically developing uh, computer-aided methods, computer-aided detection, 
early detection methods for cancer and for other diseases as well. But almost the entire career I've spent um, basically focused on lung cancer. Uh, and there's good reason for that. Um, also, I, uh, I'm a, I've always been a gamer. <laughs> and, um, you know, when you get deep into a career, it's, it's hard to continue. But I came here last year and I, I just loved everything I saw. And so I got back into it, <laughs> to be honest. And um, I, I bought, I, with a friend um, and colleague uh, who was a gamer, we, uh, we set up a new PC for me and um, I got ready for PVC3. I don't know if you know Plants vs. Zombie 3. It's a big, I'm, I'm really into that. So uh, I like PVC1, by the way, but anyway. Um, <clears throat> bottom line is, uh, on, uh, there's a huge intersection between uh, computing, uh, gaming, and healthcare. And uh, especially, uh, as mentioned earlier, AI. Um, and we, you know, when I was at GE and we were talking about, well, what's the biggest impact we could possibly have if we, if we develop an early detection method for, for disease? The answer that I came back with, it, with my team back then was lung cancer. And the reason why is on this chart. Um, this is the, uh, the US on the left, um, but uh, lung cancer has the largest number of deaths per year um, than the next three cancers combined, okay? And the, the, the needs are just so great, so incredibly great, um, that, um, uh, but, but there's some good news. Um, the good news is in this chart here. So, so again, the bad news, 1.75 million deaths per year globally for lung cancer. And the reason why, as you've seen with other speakers here, it's caught usually late. So this is another grapefruit-sized uh, cancer you see here. By this time, it's spread all over the body. You don't have a lot of time left. There's really not much that can be done, except for a few really uh, miraculous cures occasionally. What we want to do is detect what you see on the, on the right, and that's a five millimeter cancer. If you don't detect it at that, if you detect it at that stage and you take it out, your chance of being alive even 10 years later is around 80%, 85%. So, so we, we know how to do this. We know if we give a, people a CT scan annually who are at high risk, and we detect these types of these size objects, we take them out, we save lives. So what's really important though is that when we see something like that, the smaller we, the smaller we can see these little objects, these little cancers, um, the harder it is to distinguish them from just a, a benign process, like um, for example, a, an infection or, or, or um, histoblasmosis, which is a, which is a, a common, again, benign condition. So, um, so the, uh, if you could imagine, if you, if you could detect and measure a lesion in this green band and it was benign, it would stay the same size. And you'd be in that band because that's your error. You'd be within that green band as you measured, maybe up and down, but always within that green band. But if it's growing at a, at a 180 day doubling time, which is very aggressive, it would show up in the red band. And so, so you can clearly see that um, you want to get, you want to be able to image it later look, looking for growth, because that's really our best indicator of whether this is cancer in the lung. Um, you, want to, uh, you want to see if it's growing, but, um, but you have error in your measurement. And so you want to wait long enough that those two bands, the red band and the green band, no longer overlap, right? because then you'd make a mistake potentially, either a false positive or a false negative, both of which can be really, really consequential for the patient. So, so what we wanna do is make sure everybody around the world has as thin a band as possible, has as, as tight, has, a, has, a, has very little error in their measurements. And if we can't do that, many sites are gonna be treating people inappropriately. So, uh, just because, again, you're all gamers. You know what a pixel is. You probably know what a voxel is. Um, so we're doctors all over the world, including the United States, right now are using images with 512 by 512 pixels. That's what the CT scanners, the million dollar scanners are doing, except for some of the newer ones coming out right now. They're working with between six and nine pixels 
because they literally put a ruler on the image and measure the size of this object, which, which um, we can do better, but we're trying to at least make sure when they measure it, either like you see here or in three dimensions, which is even better, that they get a good measurement and that precision I was telling you about before stays really nice and solid. So uh, it turns out that if you go to community hospitals, the chances of you getting a, a poor scan are, are higher, unfortunately, or out in the, again, the, the developing world. Um, it's, it, they just have older equipment and they, they have less information. So, so what we did was um, we built a phantom uh, very low cost, again, like similar theme we heard already. Um, it normally costs around four or five thousand dollars to to put a fan. Uh, which is a calibration device that you put in a CT scanner. It normally costs around four or five thousand dollars. Then you need a medical physicist with a PhD to usually to come in, or uh, at least a master's, but but to come in and take some scanner time, a lot of scanner time. And what we did was we said, let's make something really inexpensive. You scan it in five minutes, you upload it to the cloud, and you get back an answer in five minutes. And, and we deployed that. And with all of your help, um, we basically started to push this out. And these things have, uh, these have rings in them, something like scotch tape. Again, if you were around last year, we call this an Oreo cookie. It kind of looks like an Oreo cookie, right? And then inside the surprise is, uh, it looks like scotch tape. That's for good reason, because we originally used scotch tape back in the uh, first round of this. We put scotch tape at 27 sites around the world. So our first phantom cost $1.50. This cost $250, but still very low cost. Um, you can see this scan on top was four millimeter slice thickness, the, the thickness of a slice. Uh, look at the... Look at the uh, pixelation on the top. They're literally, there's people literally scanning for detection of early lung cancer with tiny little objects. Like you see that little, you see that little ellipsoid I just drew, ellipsa. They're trying to detect that with big giant pixels and voxels. And we're trying to get them to, to get the, the, the type of image you see on the bottom, which is high resolution um, all throughout the image from the center of the image out to the, out to the periphery. And, and most scanners can do this, but most of them, many of them are not optimized for doing it right. So um, there's the, uh, the cloud I mentioned to you earlier. Um, we give back a report that's easy to understand. Again, thanks to all of you, we've put now 95 phantoms around the world and they're being used. That scan that I showed you came from the other side of the world just a few days ago, okay? And and we're helping sites all over the world. Uh, and they went from the top image to the bottom image in, in about two days. So, so we can very rapidly take sites from doing things not, not according to requirements, uh, to, to uh, international requirements, to really some of the best performance in the world. And, um, and it's growing. The network is growing. People are asking for, for this. And they're, uh, it's really exciting because we're going we're gonna to keep providing these services on the cloud. And, um, and we're, I mean, literally with a very small budget we're, uh, and these, these uh, disruptive phantoms, we're optimizing the world's CT scanners uh, um, within a year. I mean, we set up a network to optimize global CT scanners within a year. So really exciting uh, project. Uh, last year, uh, uh, we also got, f uh, beginning of last year, we got funding to do, uh, to help Poland deploy their lung cancer screening services throughout their nation. So they have 16 sites around Poland that are going to get a next generation phantom. Notice the, uh, this is not an Oreo, this is a mini Oreo. And these are smaller, it's, it, I'll show you what the phantom looks like. But, but first of all, Poland has um, the second highest lung cancer death rate in the EU and third highest incidence uh, death, uh, sorry, cancer incidence rate. Um, so we're gonna put a new phantom and I'll show it to you here. This is our new phantom. We've actually built the first prototypes. We've got the, uh, this, this, is, this is the difference between them. You can see there's a difference in size here, um, uh, right there. And, 
um, you can put water all around this phantom so it, it more mimics a human body mass, which is good because as sites try and lower radiation dose, they often don't, don't realize they, they lose image quality and resolution in particular. So with this phantom, even, and it's still low cost, um, sites around the world, and particularly right now for Poland, are going to be able to really optimize their radiation dose as well as, um, as, well as make, maintain very high image quality. And why is this also important? Because the world is, as Jim said, moving very quickly to advanced AI algorithms. First of all, they're generating images with AI. And that's changing these images in ways that probably most people don't even realize. If we don't have something in place, and we've seen this before, if we don't have something in place that makes sure that we have the quality needed, there can be a lot of, um, a lot of unintended bad consequences. Uh, but the second thing is, anything that takes an image and then tries to determine early detection or whether, whether something's growing or anything else, whether it's AI or not, or whether it's machine learning, traditional machine learning, it, it starts with the image. If the image isn't good, it's not gonna get good results. It's gonna have a much harder time. Garbage in, garbage out. So, so really, again, uh, thank, uh, I wanna thank the whole community for all you've done to build out this global network that's uh, helping sites like Poland and the rest of the world, you can see, in maintaining very high quality. And this doesn't even just apply to lung cancer because once you have a CT scan of the chest, you can also look at cardiovascular, you know, cardiovascular issues, particularly coronary artery disease, as well as uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, fourth leading cause of death in the United States. And, and coronary artery disease is probably number one, <laughs> so, or cardiovascular, I should say. So, uh, so these are some initial results. We've, we've written the software. We've built the first prototypes. We're about to do the final manufacturing run for the first 16. A CTLX2 phantoms, they're called, and uh, we're going to get these out to Poland. We were on the phone with Poland just the other day. Um, they're really excited. Uh, we have another project also that's helping with software in Poland, and um, and uh, just imagine, you know, ro the first major national rollout of lung cancer screening since in the last year or so is going to happen in Poland. And thanks to the again awesome Games Done Quick community, um, it's going to be done well. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Rick, and thank all the presenters. Um, now, Erica had made sure that we had set aside a very generous amount of time because the bottom line here is uh, what do you think about what's going on? Do you have additional questions? Do you have concerns? Do you have suggestions? So um, this is, we had a dialogue last year and we want to continue kind of getting input and, and getting feedback about what we're doing right and what we could do better. Yes, sir, do you want to please go to the microphone so everybody can hear? Thank you. Um, I, I, is it, yeah, there it goes. Um, I'm interested very much in going into the medical field for organ creation and something along the lines is when she was talking was that um, the, the ethanol treatment, if you were to find late stage cancer in certain crucial organs, would it be possible to pull that, pull that organ out, put in a new one, wait for the body to get to the stage where it's like, okay, it's enough to where the organ isn't rejected and then go in for the heavy treatment to help the outsiding area. W would that theoretically be possible? <laughs> cool idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's actually... Uh, okay. it's, you wanna... No, no, I just... So, you know, we use transplantation as a treatment for cancer currently, uh, for liver cancers, actually. Um, and one of the problems we have is that by the time things are late stage, there's usually microscopic cancer in lots of parts of the body. So it's not the... Uh, uh, the organ of origin that is the real issue. It's a whole body problem. So transplantation like that is a great treatment and a curative treatment for isolated cancer when we can't cut it out with surgery and leave the organ in, and we have to take the whole organ out. Um, but there is a huge field now in regenerative medicine. 
which is sort of what, what you're talking about is this organ generation because the problem is if, for instance, for livers, if you're, you need a liver transplantation to, as the only potential treatment that can cure your cancer or you need a liver transplantation because you have cirrhosis and end-stage liver disease, you don't, you don't have a cancer but you have a life-threatening problem, most patients who are in that situation die before getting a transplantation um, because there aren't enough organs. So uh, there are people that are trying to do this. You know, you've probably seen pictures of like ears grown on mice and things like this um, that are trying to figure out how can you develop an artificial organ. Um, and so this is a, a huge field now where there's been no, no successes in, in making new organs like this, but lots of people interested in it. So I think you've picked a good topic. Um, because it's one that right now is a wide open field um, and people are really starting to pay attention to this because there's a massive need worldwide for transplantations and there's a huge lack of organs. Yeah, and if I could add, um, I'm going to flip around your suggestion. The reason why you heard about early detection is because when you find an early cancer, a cancer that's still in the organ in which it first started, you find it there in part because it doesn't yet know how to grow in that distant site. And as tumors stay in your body longer and they're subjected to pressures, they develop greater ability to grow in different new environments, metastatic disease, okay? So we want to get early detection because that primary that doesn't know yet how to grow, when you pull that out, it's cured. And they go back to clone zero. So, so early detection works because it, it has not yet evolved the metastatic potential of something that can grow in bone or liver or some other distant site. So that's why there's a, a, a big difference between the initial location of a tumor and metastatic tumor. Metastatic tumor, it's much more dangerous, much more lethal. Thank you. A, a, additional question? Oh. We can, we can, thank you. That was really my only question. I just wanted to know your thoughts on the matter. <laughs> thank, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Steven. I was actually um, at your panel last year. Uh, so I'm curious, thank you. Um, if this is your first time at a GDQ, what has been kind of surprising experiences or novel experiences you've, ha uh, you've had? Or if you're returning to um, a GDQ event, um, what new surprising things have you experienced this time around? Well, so I, I've never been here before, and I actually know uh, before getting funded by Prevent Cancer Foundation with the money that comes out of this event, I knew nothing about uh, any events like this. I grew up playing uh, video games in medical school that continued after medical school. Most things like that all disappeared. Um, but I've actually, uh, so, it, so it's, it's amazing to me that this whole community exists and then that it exists in such a massive way. That, and I, I was sort of shocked that I didn't know about it. Uh, I'm sort of embarrassed I didn't because of how big it is. And, and, and the fact that you can raise this much money um, and care about where the money goes and be donating the money and doing it in a community way, I think is, is awesome. Um, so it, 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 it's been inspiring to me to, to see this and you know there's people right now as I said in Nigeria who know that I'm here talking and they're all fascinated too about you know this is wait, people playing video games who are now supporting stuff we're doing in Nigeria so uh, I, I think it, it's just been an awesome experience to, to see the enthusiasm and the community that you guys are all a part of Thank you. so I had a snafu at the airport and I just got here so I have yet to see um, all the exciting stuff, but I mean, the idea of having fun and saving lives, um, what a great idea. I, I'm not a gamer, I've never done that. I mean, I play chess. Um, <laughs> sorry, but I'm very open-minded and I'm looking forward to, um, to seeing um, the dynamism that's happening outside um, this place. Really? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> well, I could say I haven't had a chance to look this time, but I'm going to spend some time out there. And uh, uh, I remember, again, coming here last year and going into the, the video room where you, video game room where you have all the, uh, the practice sessions, I guess it is. 
and all these old monitors. And I, I, was, I was wondering, what, <laughs> what's going on with the old monitors? And, and I asked, and they said, well, the game doesn't, doesn't the, the, well, the game doesn't have as high a resolution and other things with, with the newer monitors or other, I don't know all the issues. But so, so of course, after uh, last year, I, I had to, because I saw some really cool Super Monkey Ball runs last year. Uh, I came back to our house and we set up Super Monkey Ball and we put it up against our big, you know, giant TV and it looked like garbage. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I got to get an old monitor now. <laughs> so anyway, I've learned a lot. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, I will also give you some objective feedback in terms of the response that uh, Rick has had as returning to uh, Awesome Games. Uh, the strongest endorsement of how enthusiastic about this is that his two daughters, who are gamers, <laughs> have come to join us. <laughs> Other questions or? Thank you so much. Uh, good evening. Um, well, it's afternoon. But anyways, um, I, we know that cancer can be hereditary. It can be driven by you know the, what we eat and what we do in our daily lives. But we also know it can be environmental impacted too. Um, with the recent uh, stuff that's gone down in Fukushima, mm -hmm. how much of the, that are you looking at to sit there and try and get a better prediction and be able to put, possibly get ahead of what we know as radiation, cancer from like ra the radiation meltdowns and what's going into our waters like the cesium and, and stuff like that. Because we sit there and we talk about we're treating can cancer with things like radiation and chemo, but we're also finding that radiation can, can cause it also in the long term. So there's that double-edged, double-bladed sword there that it can be a benefit as well as it can be a cause. So are, are we looking in the future at looking at what's happening because we did it with uh, Chernobyl, we did it with Three Mile Island, we did it with, uh, I think it was Fermi 2 in, in Detroit, Michigan. We, we've done it with these meltdown sites. So the, the question is, are we looking at those statistics? Are we looking at that and sitting there going, all eyes on this because we could potentially have a future of preventative cancer from an environmental impact? Yeah, so uh, this is a pretty vibrant uh, field of science and, um, you know, virtually everything we think is good in the wrong doses is bad. You know, sunshine, sugar, you know, you pick it. And so um, it's incredibly important that we gather data because we're constantly surprised by things that appear benign and turn out to be, you know, untoward in certain settings. And um, the radiation that's used, like in medical imaging, in certain settings to get at deep organs, you have to use higher doses, and sometimes those doses could have sustained effects, especially, you know, uh, in young people who have a lifetime of, of potential to manifest those things. So this is very carefully looked at. There's a number of federal agencies. There's a number, number of international agencies. Um, Fukushima is, is, is a recent example, and you'll be happy to know that the international agencies, as well as the Japanese, have done absolute, comprehensive, exhaustive evaluations of root cause related to that accident, looking at all their procedures, all the construction processes and whatnot, and now have developed, you know, far and away more rigorous guidelines for how to, how to um, run a nuclear facility. Mm -hmm. and, and now we're going to be looking again at nuclear energy because of constraints with other fuel sources and stuff like that. And because of that experience in Fukushima, every facility in the world hopefully will be upgraded and, and potentially a much safer facility. But you're absolutely correct. Um, I think the best example of the kind of thing that you're talking about right now is the impact of pollution in urban centers and, um, and uh, um, diesel exhausts. And it's turning out that when you start looking at these things carefully, that there are biological consequences, there are medical consequences, and as a result of that, we're gonna to have to do a lot of things. It turns out that the exposure rates in certain intersections during red lights are unbelievable. 
And so maybe we should get rid of red lights. I mean, <laughs> but, but th there's, there's issues like this that we have to become more attentive to and develop mediation for. Yeah, the, the, the reason it came up was because there was the mention of Poland. And yeah. Poland, when, when uh, Chernobyl hit, the winds went north. And it was Germany, Poland, and then it swept back towards the Atlantic in, 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 a, in a couple of days. So you talked about high cancer rates in Poland. I'm sitting there going, well, we just had something like this happen where, and the winds luckily went out the Pacific, but <laughs> we, we were seeing that the cancer rates went up in you know, Ukraine, Germany, Poland because of Chernobyl, and that's 20, 30 years later. Now all of a sudden we have Fukushima. What can we expect? Or has that ever been run? Has that been... You know, the, the, it's the statistical model I'm, so, I'm interested in. So. so here's another good idea, um, the, I mean, that you just brought up, uh, uh, the audience brought up. <laughs> Basically, um, lung cancer screening is going to start in Poland any day now, literally any day now. And a whole bunch of, a very large number of people are going to be annually screened. And some of those have lived through the experience of Chernobyl and, uh, and other things and may have gotten s some effect. That data could start to answer questions like you're describing. When you when you get the late stage cancer, you know, images, they're not going to they're not going to be able to tell you a lot because that's a again it's a it, unfortunate, uh, devastating effect on the body. But to see the natural history of lung cancer over time, and perhaps see something like uh, radiation exposure. And lastly, I'll just say that you know when you release radiation into the environment. It can go in all kinds of all kinds of places and be concentrated in mollusks and in all sorts of other things that, that very few people, uh, you know, fully understand. So, um, so I think uh, maybe in another couple of years we'll be able to come back and start to answer some of that some of that question there. Thank you. Thank you. Next, next. thank you. Hi, um, I really enjoyed all your presentations. I study biostatistics and um, certainly like prevention and cancer screening is a very controversial issue in biostatistics and epidemiology because it's a hard statistical problem, right? There's lots of biases. Um, new like Google algorithm recently came out on breast cancer detection and being better than clinical care is very complicated because it was retrospective rather than prospective. So. What I really enjoyed about all of your presentations is you're looking at ways to collect more data or data more accurately. And I was wondering if you have any thoughts on collaborating with statisticians and um, other projects to um, uh, explore the ways that um, uncovering possible heterogeneities in these different populations what could uh, describe or, or help describe the environment of um, how screening may um, help the overall cancer landscape and um, hopefully like develop more targeted programs other than just recommending mammograms for everyone over 18 or something um, unachievable like that. Jim. So I, let me just start out. I'm sure everybody has a comment about this because it's such an important area that you're raising. And uh, let me just say that uh, Rick and I have been working with the Radi uh, Radiological Society of North America for the last 10 years because uh, RSNA is a professional society of radiologists. I'm not a radiologist, and Rick's a computer scientist, so you already heard, but they invited us in for some reason, and uh, unexplained. But um, <laughs> they have been trying to build a better analytical structure, framework for analyzing screening data and stuff like that for the reasons that you've cited. And it turns out that we expected this to be about a year project. And about eight years later, we're saying, you know, what did we do wrong? Well, basically, there wasn't a science of the analysis. And so that has been led by a biostatistician, Nancy Opachowski from the Cleveland Clinic, who, with all the other metrologists, computational people, have put together systematic ways of measuring the various f 
features of the imaging process because everybody was using terms different ways. Engineers versus computer scientists, computer scientists versus med physics, whatever, whatever. And so first of all, we had to create a language and everybody could know what a pen was, you know? And, and, and there was a issue of a biostats uh, journal that was dedicated to just imaging metrology. And it basically started you know, with basically the 10 commandments of, of, of how you to start expressing correctly various measurements of various features that are part of, 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 of uh, accurate, robust, reliable imaging. And, and perhaps Rick can talk about this because he's been intimately involved. But that was led by Nancy Obachowski, and she has references that are now, you know, kind of the gospel that biostatisticians that are getting into this field can now have much more productive conversations because it's standardized the metrics. That's one thing. The second thing is AI. We bounced around AI and stuff like that. And st statisticians are always telling people like me, we need more data. We need more data. Mm -hmm. AI is only going to be as good as the data that is used to generate the, the rules. And right now, even that Google thing, I mean, the Google people who did the breast study that you, that you alluded to, you know, they're now being sued because they didn't have access, appropriate access to a large part of that data. <laughs> well, that's a big problem. We need massive data sets to develop these robust new tools so that we can do it right. And, and right now we have appropriate concern about privacy and privacy protections and stuff like that. And so we gotta find an appropriate balance so we can get ground truth to develop these tools, but also we respect the autonomy of individuals. So it's an incredibly important area. It's not resolved, but you're bringing up exactly the right points. Uh, other comments? Yeah, I just wanted to add that, you know, I mean, in order to do statistics, you need data, right? And so these tools generate data. And one thing that we've really tried very hard to do is, is well, two things. One is we've been very opportunistic. I mean, we go all over the world and participate in different studies because it allows us to gather data. And, and now we've got about 2,000 images that we can do something, <clears throat> do something with. The second part is the standardization. I mean, just because you have lots of data, if they're all over the place, then that's not very useful. So I think that um, standardization and really thinking about, I mean, I was actually surprised that people are selling data, right? They're certain, like, Data's a lot of value, um, but we also want to put it in the public domain. But if we put it in the public domain for people to use, to analyze, we have to be really, really sure that it's of the highest quality and that it reflects the heterogeneity that we would see in the populations. And so I think for us, with cervical cancer, working globally has been very important because we found out that algorithms that we develop in certain places just fail because there are other confounding factors. And you don't think about that, right? So being able to have heterogeneity built into your data set and having clean data that has been acquired in a consistent way, I think are important precedents to the analysis. Uh, and I'll, I'll add in one final thing. So I'm a surgeon. I trained until I was age 37. Um, so spent a lot of my life training. But that didn't allow me to spend the same amount of time in training in things like biostatistics and epidemiology, right? So I'm a, I'm a surgeon, I'm a clinician, and I, I know enough that I could write a research study to inappropriately study this device and potentially say that this is useful and saves lives when actually it doesn't. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the key to all of what we're showing you is this team approach, and this seems to be a very collaborative group here. Um, we all fail if we're not collaborative. You may succeed in the short term, but you're not going to succeed in the long term. So usually the first stop is us thinking up these ideas, and then the second stop is at my biostatistician and epidemiologist office saying, here's what we're thinking of, here's the population, here's our hypothesis, here's our questions. And then by the time we walk out of that office, it is completely changed how we're thinking about the problem and how we're approaching it. Because otherwise, we're, we're wasting time, and more importantly, we're wasting the potential to help patients and potentially can harm patients. So. Um, there, uh, this is uh, absolutely hand in hand, the idea of biostatistics, epidemiology, and cancer prevention and studying it. I want to add one more thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, the world is trying to figure out how to protect your data right now, okay? And what that's doing is it's killing a lot of research. 
it's really, really hurting massive data sets. I mean, if we can get 10,000 cases, we're, we're very fortunate to be able to run, to do an algorithm or to evaluate a, evaluate a new approach or anything like that. But there's literally, I just told you, there's 1.75 million deaths in lung cancer per year. And we can only get a tiny, I mean, barely a, a fraction of a fraction of that data for, for analysis and for future development. So at the recent quantitative imaging workshop put on by the Prevent Cancer Foundation, we got together and we said, well, you know, we did an experiment a few years ago, um, something called Give a Scan, where patients could donate their data to science. And uh, we, we gathered about 100 cases, but it was painful and it took a lot of work. And, um, but, but since then, since we did that, electronic health records have become more and more used around the world. So the thinking is, well, what if we, what if we let people globally opt in to releasing their data, maybe on death, maybe, uh, maybe now, maybe whatever, but I, I would be the first uh, to try and get in on that line and uh, just keep an eye out because we're gonna try and make that happen. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, I wanted to first thank you guys all for coming um, and speaking to us, and also thank you for all the work that you're doing. Um, Peter, in your little circle there in the beginning, you're talking about the different, the different parts, and it seems like all of you are really involved in the diagnostic. Um, I'm really interested in causative. You know, you hear in the news, like, all these things that they say can cause cancer or other diseases and stuff, and I see like very little research on, you know, what, what, how we're preventing those things. And also I'm curious about as far as like um, collaborating with agencies as far as like policy and stuff like that. Uh, is that anything you guys can speak to? <laughs> um, so we think Prevent Cancer shares your concern about lack of fundamental understanding mm -hmm of, of um, the uh, homeostasis of, 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 of health. And we need to flesh that out and do more work on it. So absolutely agree with it. In terms of working things into a policy dimension, um, uh, Bo quietly sits there, but she um, has been a trusted source on Capitol Hill on policy issues for health for decades. Uh, Bo's foundation and Bo's work led to Colon Cancer Awareness Month. The colon cancer was the first disease to actually have a month where they started thinking about things and, and, and had designation. Second? Breast. Oh, breasts. So it followed breasts. But within margin of error, the first. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but Bo operates at a policy level. And... Uh, they have a, a, a meeting during the course of the year called the uh, Dialogue for Cancer Action in which they get um, uh, state health workers from across the country to come and talk about how can they accelerate progress in terms of, of legislative action and other things for, for uh, cancer prevention strategies, vaccination programs and whatnot. It, it is an underserved area. And it is one that has, you know, as our nation is beset by aging and chronic diseases, is going to assume more importance because people now know that, you know, we can't, we can't replace every hip and every knee in the world. At some point, we have to start dealing with the fundamentals of prevention. And at some level, we have to, from a policy perspective, develop a rational basis for a policy that, that encourages healthy living. And, and you see it now. Uh, the American Lung Association just did a, um, a, a map of smoking across the countries and looked at state by state how much smoking was going on in, in, in Nevada versus Vermont versus New Jersey. And it turns out that there's a big difference from state to state. And that's not genetic. That's, that's something else. And certain places have taxes and certain places don't. And certain places have other activities in terms of education in the schools and other places don't. So policy is enormously important. 
Prevent Cancer Foundation has a, an entire group that focuses on this and collaborates with a lot of other professional societies and advocacy organizations that also share that interest. But it's something that requires much more attention and much more focus. Yeah, uh, you know, we drew that circle because every one of those pieces really matters. And I think if you study just one of those pieces, then you're not looking at the patient, you know, as a whole. And the idea of, of thinking of uh, what causes cancers and preventing them uh, is, is very important. And there's not a lot of support for it, right? There's no drug companies that are paying for nutritional studies looking at diet and cancer. Um, so in Nigeria specifically, we're trying to figure out what is it that happens when a culture starts adapting towards uh, much less active lifestyle, uh, fast food, weight gain, all these things. And how, is it some mix of that combined with what exists there already? So we're doing what's called a case control study. So we have the patients who have cancer and we have uh, thousands of patients who live in uh, villages near the, our main city who, who don't have cancer. And we've been studying what they eat, what their environmental exposures are. Do they cook on an open stove with coal? Uh, all, all these types of things. And Questionnaires to get at this don't exist currently, so we've spent a lot of time developing this for that region. And in a couple of years, we may start to get at what are the, what are the unique risks there that are causing such a fast rise in cancer. We're also looking at things like, like uh, infection. So um, the, the microbiome is a term that, that, that some of you may have heard. Now a lot of us are starting to look at the microbiome of lots of different cancers, especially colon cancer. Is there something in the diet there that is leading towards different bacteria in the gut that then you add in these other factors like fast food and weight gain that, that turns on more of these cancer genes? Um, so it's an area that we're all struggling to, to, to get more support for because traditionally it's not very well supported. But in the end, it's so much more worthwhile to study that and early cancer diagnosis than, yeah. than the late stage treatment. Absolutely. So that's what we're targeting. Thank you. Uh, if there's not other burning questions, I think that's it. I wanna thank everybody for coming and attending. I wanna thank the presenters for their, their um, really important efforts and, and sharing that with us. I want to thank the organizers for allowing us to have this forum, and I want to thank the, um, the staff of the Prevent Cancer Foundation that has helped set this up and helped us to, to uh, be in a position to um, find these, these opportunities to move the ball up the hill. Thank you. <laughs>